As some of you may know, um, I was a last minute addition actually to the uh, schedule. So um, this topic, this talk wasn't actually developed specifically for the workshop. So you'll notice there are some slides that are going to seem out of place. I'll try to speed over some of those introductory slides and get to the things that might interest you. Um, <coughs> so today I'll be talking about hierarchical topic modeling. Um, so when you're faced with some large scale data set, how do you learn the latent topics hidden within that data set? Obviously this has applications everywhere, but specifically we'll be interested in some medical applications. I'm going to present um, both a method for that, that task, neural NMF, and then I'll zoom in on one of the sub-problems we um, uh, end up kind of encountering during neural NMF, and I'll talk about a family of methods I've been studying for that specific sub-problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll begin with a little bit of a motivation, and so that motivation is a um, medical survey data set. Um, I'll describe the model we're going to be discussing, a method for solving that model neural NMF, zoom in on these iterative projection methods. I'll finally come back, apply neural NMF to um, some data sets, and then I'll offer some conclusions. Okay. So my motivation in getting into hierarchical topic modeling was an actual data set known as my Lyme data. Okay, so this is a large collection of Lyme disease patient survey data. So many of you are probably familiar with Lyme disease and think of it as a solved problem. And for many patients it is. So many patients are diagnosed with Lyme disease, are given a short course of antibiotics, and go on to never experience the symptoms that are associated with Lyme disease again. But unfortunately, somewhere between 10 and 40% of patients, estimated by the CDC, uh, have persisting symptoms. And those symptoms can last for months to even years afterwards, after they finish their short course of antibiotics. So LymeDisease.org is a um, patient advocacy group who have come in to try to understand what is going on with this disease, and specifically with these patients experiencing persisting symptoms. So they've delivered uh, patient surveys to a group of about 12,000 patients, asking them over several months and years, roughly hundreds of questions. And when they came to us, uh, they were interested in understanding the latent topics present inside that data. And after a little bit of massaging, we learned that they weren't just interested in kind of the basic topic modeling technique, but they really wanted to get something that had, had a multi-scale resolution. Okay, so they wanted not just the symptom information that their patients were experiencing collecting into some um, natural clusters or groups, topics, but even those topics collecting into super topics. And the reason that they were interested in this is that they had this large scale data set that the physicians they work with were struggling to understand and identify the patterns within. And so they wanted us to do this for them um, to help assist them with hypothesis formation about post-treatment Lyme disease. And so the main question today is how can we identify the topic hierarchy within this specific symptom data set? And the answer I'm going to pose is a new method that we've developed known as neural non-negative matrix factorization. And this is actually work that began with one of the UCLA CAM REUs. Um, so this is a group of 13 undergraduate students, five of which worked on this topic that I'll now describe, this method. Okay, and like I said, I'll, I'll zoom in actually on um, a sub-problem within neural NMF, and I'll talk about a family of methods I've been studying for quite a while, known as the sampling kashmart smotskin method. Turns out they're also related to computerized tomography, so we'll talk about that too. And along the way, I'll present, I'll focus mainly on uh, recent work with my collaborator, Anna Ma. Okay, so topic modeling, what can we do? Right? Well, there's lots of options when you're tasked with topic modeling with a data set. So there's highly classical things, principal component analysis, clustering. You know, I'm sure you could all pick your own, um, name a few more. But we're going to focus in on one specific model known as non-negative matrix factorization. And the reason that I'm going to focus on this uh, model is illustrated in the experiment whose picture I'm showing. Okay, so by the way, non-negative matrix factorization has been in the aura for quite a while. Um, it was explicitly described in a 1994 paper by Patero and Tapper, but then it really kind of gained a lot of popularity after a 1999 Nature article uh, by Lee and Se-Young. And I think the reason that it's been popularized so much is visible in this picture. 
So what I'm showing here is an experiment from their 1999 paper where they apply non-negative matrix factorization to a data set consisting of a bunch of human faces. Okay? So when they pull out the topics achieved by uh, non-negative matrix factorization, what they discovered was that this was actually pulling out parts of the objects in the data set. Okay? So it was pulling out pieces of faces, eyes, nose, mouths, rather than like the eigenfaces developed by a PCA approach. Okay. And the reason that that was so ideal for them is that um, additive combinations are easily human interpretable. Right? It's very easy for us if I say, you know that face you're looking at, it's composed of one eye plus one eye plus a nose. It's much harder if I say something like, that's composed of an eye plus negative a third a nose plus one fourth of a mouth minus one third of a nose. Right? That can be really challenging. Okay, so this is kind of the reason we're focusing on this non-negative matrix factorization model because we want something that's going to be naturally interpretable later on. Okay, so probably many of you have seen non-negative matrix factorization, but if you haven't, let me just give you a brief inter uh, uh, introduction. So here I'm illustrating non-negative matrix factorization applied in our specific application data set. So we have a, a symptoms by participants matrix, uh, data matrix X, and it's non-negative. And non-negative matrix factorization asks us to compute two factor matrices, A and S. So the columns of A are going to be topics or archetypal objects um, composing the objects in X. Okay? And the highlighted column in S um, gives the additive uh, coefficients who when multiplied onto the columns of A and then some those will approximately um, form the object that's highlighted in the X matrix. Okay, okay and in general, um, it, when we perform this model, we're, we have to choose a number of topics K, and that's generally a user-defined um, parameter, and it can represent some a priori information that the user has about the data set that they're working with. Okay, this is obviously often formulated as an optimization problem where we want to minimize the distance between our original data set X and the model A times S. And the challenge here is that in both A and S, this is a non-convex optimization problem. It's biconvex, so if you fix either A or S and optimize over the other, it's a nice convex optimization problem. Um, but it's even NP-hard just to compute the global optimum for some fixed K. Okay. okay, so that's a complex model. So let's make it a little bit more complex. <laughs> Um, hierarchical NMF is exactly like it sounds. It's a hierarchy of applications of non-negative matrix factorization. So if you imagine the first application of NMF to a data set collects your objects into some set of topics, then to collect those topics into super topics, you just need to apply NMF once more. Right? And that's exactly what one would do. So we'll have this sequence of user-defined parameters, KL, and at uh, the ELF layer, this is um, collecting the KL minus one subtopics into KL supertopics. Okay. And one thing to note, and this is kind of where we come in, is that if you're not careful, and you just apply the naive approach of applying NMF once with your favorite, favorite NMF method, and then you move on to the second factor matrice, matrix and simply apply NMF again, the error the mismatch between the model and the original data set in each of those factorization layers is just going to propagate through the sequence of layers. Okay? And that can be devastating to, to our results. So this is where we come in. Um, we developed what's known as neural NMF to attempt to use later factorizations in later layers to influence previous factorizations, therefore trying to achieve a better final factorization, hierarchical factorization. Okay, so a reminder, we have these symptoms collecting into topics, collecting into super topics, and I think probably a lot of people have already jumped ahead. Neural NMF is simply HNMF implemented into a feed-forward neural network structure. Okay, so we'll spend the first portion of the talk just showing how this can be implemented in that form. Okay, so like I said, some of these slides probably unnecessary, but I'm just going to get us all on the same page notation-wise. So we have this feed-forward neural network. It's mapping input vectors x to output vectors y via nonlinear transformation. Right? At every layer, we apply an affine transformation defined by the weight matrix W and then entry-wise some 
nonlinear transformation, simple nonlinear transformation. Okay? And the goal is, of course, to learn the weights that define uh, the nonlinear transformation that approximates some ideal nonlinear transformation that you'd like. Okay. And so I'm going to visualize it this way because I think it'll assist us in putting this in analogy with the hierarchical NMF model. So if we start, we have our input, layer, uh, input vector x at our initial layer. To get between layers, we simply apply this nonlinear transformation, uh, sigma of multiplication times w1. Okay. And so um, when we're training, of course, we forward propagate. We push through all of our training data um, forward via all of these nonlinear maps until we get to our last layer. And then we back propagate using a gradient descent step. OK, so what does our method do? Our method, neural NMF, our goal was to really develop a true forward and back propagation algorithm for this model, HNMF. <coughs> but we have kind of a significantly different scenario than, you do, than one does in a um, feed-forward neural network. So in a feed-forward neural network, right, we imagine all of these weight matrices are fixed. And then in every layer, when we push forward one layer to the next, we simply put in our input, and we have a well-defined map taking us to the output of that layer. Right? There's only one unknown. But for us, in every layer, there's two unknowns, both A and S. Okay? So the first step is to fix some set of those mat matrices. For us, we'll fix those A matrices, viewing them as independent variables, and then allow the S matrices to be defined simply by the fixed A matrices and the input to each layer. Okay? So to do that, we're going to define a nonlinear transformation that, with a fixed A matrix, will pull us through each of those layers. So this is just going to be um, a non-negative least squares um, optimization <coughs> problem. So we'll minimize over all of the appropriately sized S matrices um, the mismatch between our true, our input to the layer X, and our model defined by the fixed matrix A for the layer. Okay. So we're pinning the values of S to those of A, and we're defining all of the S matrices recursively. The output from the layer is simply defined as the least squares optimum of the um, uh, mismatch between the uh, output from the L minus first layer and the fixed matrix AL. OK, so the picture looks like this. right? We have a nonlinear transformation now, which is defined by this A0 ma matrix mapping X to S0. And then the same thing, but now with the A1 matrix mapping S0 to S1. Okay. Oh, OK. So uh, the neural NMF method then um, is going to use both a forward propagation and a back propagation step. So forward propagation is just what I described, going forward. And then for back propagation, we'll need to differentiate and update all of the A matrices simultaneously. Okay. That is, in fact, the very challenging portion, and I won't talk about that in the talk. Okay. So the forward propagation step, right? we're solving this um, convex optimization problem. And in fact, it turns out that least squares, just simple least squares, is the fundamental subroutine that we encounter. Okay, so if you imagine this least squares problem, we're minimizing the mismatch between the product A times S and X. You could actually do this column-wise. So this least squares problem is the fundamental subroutine that we encounter in the uh, forward propagation. And we're going to use iterative met projection methods to solve these problems. Okay. So let me introduce some iterative projection methods. So I said we were going to solve least squares problems, but I actually fudged a little bit. I'm going to instead for this talk just consider highly overdetermined systems of equations. Although let me promise all of the methods that I'll describe, there are versions of which that solve the least squares problem rather than uh, systems of equations. Okay, and um, the geometric intuition here is if we're sig seeking the signal x, we're seeking the intersection of the hyperplane solution spaces of each of the individual equations defined by a row of our matrix A. Okay, so the iterative projection methods are iterative, and if we have a, a consistent system, they'll construct an approximation to the solution. Okay, so the first um, method I'll describe is the randomized Kashmars method, which has applications in computerized tomography. It goes, there it goes by the algebraic reconstruction technique. 
I'll describe a kind of sister method known as Motzkin's method, which was popularized around the time that linear programming really became hot after World War II. And then I'll describe a family of methods which generalize the above two methods known as sampling Kashmir's Motzkin methods, or SKM. Okay? And if you're familiar with the average consensus problem from distributed computing, this method goes as the greedy gossip with eavesdropping method. Okay, so what is the Kashmir's method? So it's an iterative method, meaning we'll start at any initial point, x0, and we're going to construct better and better approximations to our solution by projecting, forcing ourselves to satisfy one of the equations. Okay? And the way that we're going to select the equation that we're going to force ourselves to satisfy is randomly in this case. So here I'm using the probability distribution where the probability you select any given row of your matrix is proportional to the norm of the row. Okay? And then we'll simply project onto that hyperplane and repeat the process. Okay? So I randomly sampled the hyperplane given there. I project onto it. I randomly sample again. I project. I randomly sample again. I project. And we can see that we're, we're converging closer to the solution. Okay, so what is Motzkin's method? So it's a highly similar method, the difference being that it's not randomized, but it's actually a greedy type method. So rather than choosing the next row um, randomly, we're going to choose greedily by looking through the entire residual, uh, AX minus B, and choosing the largest magnitude entry. Okay, so again, we start with some initial point. If the rows of the matrix all have unit norm, then this is simply choosing the hyperplane which is furthest from our current iterant, and making the largest step possible. Okay, so if we um, look through all of these hyperplanes, choose the one which is uh, furthest from this point, it's this one, we'll project, and now the furthest hyperplane is this one, and we project, and you can see we're getting closer to the solution, and of course we're doing so much, much faster. Okay, and then here is a, a hybrid family of methods which generalize both of the above two methods. Okay, and um, the hybrid method is going to have aspects of both of the previous methods. It's both going to have a randomization step and it's going to have a deterministic and greedy step. Okay, so um, we're going to randomly sample, in this case I'm using beta to represent the sample size, beta many rows. In this picture it's two rows and then from amongst that two rows I'm going to choose greedily which to project onto. Okay, so I'm going to project onto the further of the two lines. Okay, and now I'm going to randomly sample two again and project onto the further. Okay, and of course, we're, you know, again, converging to the solution. <coughs> I said this generalizes both of the above two methods. So let me just say, right, for randomized Kashmars, that's when beta is equal to one. We're randomly sampling one row and then being greedy within that sub-residual. For Motzkin's method, we're randomly sampling all of the rows and then being greedy amongst the full residual. Okay. <clears throat> so if you implement these methods, you'll almost always, on a consistent system, you'll almost always get a picture that looks like this. So what I'm plotting here is the squared error, the distance from the current iterate to the true solution of the system of equations, over many iterations of these SKM methods. The black line here is randomized Kashmars. The um, pink line is Motzkin's method, and then we have all of the different SKM methods in between. And unsurprisingly, what we see is that for larger sample sizes, we converge faster, right? Okay, so this is not what I find the most interesting. What I actually find the most interesting is this plot on the right. So again, the same scenario, we have um, squared error on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we actually have wall clock time. Okay? And what we find is that even though Motzkin's method is converging fastest in iteration, it's converging the slowest when it comes to wall clock time. The reason being that the cost in iteration of forming the entire residual is very expensive. Right? But more interestingly, we also notice that randomized Kashmars isn't the fastest. Okay? Instead, we have um, somewhere, some beta between 1 and m, which is the, the fastest. There's some sweet spot for beta. Okay, so this is one of the things that I would like to know how to do. If you hand me a system, I'd like to be able to hand back the best sample size or learn it quickly. Okay? In order to do that, though, I need to understand first this behavior. So let me present what was known. 
So I'm going to show you the convergence rate for all of the methods I've described on a consistent system which has unique solution and whose rows have been normalized, just for simplicity. Okay, so in 2009, Stromer and Vershin improved this nice seminal result about randomized cashmars, which shows that it converges at least linearly in expectation. Okay, and the ratio between um, uh, consecutive error terms is no more, in expectation is no more than this uh, value, one minus the minimum singular value of A squared over M. Okay. Now, Motzkin's method, in way back in 1954, Eggman actually proved the same convergence rate. Now it's deterministic, right, because um, Motzkin's method is not randomized. And again, the worst case ratio between consecutive error terms is again the same value, one minus the minimum singular value of A squared over M. Okay, so unsurprisingly, right, we were pinned between the two preceding results. So we were able to show when we proposed the methods in 2017, the same expected convergence rate, the same constant. Now let me briefly say why this isn't satisfactory and what I would have expected to see. So you would hope if you're spending all of this extra time constructing these beta size residuals, that as those residuals get larger, you see an improvement in your convergence rate. So what I had expected to see was an increasing function of beta sitting here in front of this constant, increasing uh, the convergence and decreasing the ratio between consecutive error terms. Okay, so why are these all the same convergence rates? <coughs> and the answer is because, okay, so um, you can construct a really simple pathological example where you can't see this increase in convergence rate for um, larger sample size or uh, as large uh, an increase in convergence rate as you might hope. So imagine this can just be in two dimensions. You have many, many, many copies of two lines. One of them is the purple line. One of them is the teal line. And if you imagine the behavior of any of the methods I've described, they're going to be roughly the same, right? It's either the initial iterate is going to go up and then down, up, down, up, down, or it's going to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, okay? So in either case, the behavior is basically the same. And now let's ask ourselves what happens if we are, are running randomized cashmars and what happens if we are running Motzkin. So if we run Motzkin's method, right, in every iteration, it's going to identify one of the hyperplanes that it's not currently lying on and make an actual projection step. So we'll move up, down, up, down, up, down, every iteration. If we think of randomized cashmars, right, it's going to, you know, project for sure in the first step. And then roughly half of the time, it's going to accidentally sample one of the rows it's currently standing on and make no pr progress in that iteration. Okay? So what we see is that Motzkin's method is only converging roughly twice as fast as randomized cache marks, even though we might have hoped to see some function of m times as fast of convergence rate. Okay? So we're not going to be able to prove a worst case convergence rate like the one I described that has this increasing function of beta present unless we kind of look into our system and grab hold of some of the geometry that allows us to prove something better. So what can we grab hold of within the geometry of the system? So a lot of people have kind of thought in this direction and have looked to use sparsity within the residual, right? So if there's many, many zeros in the residual, being greedy will help you avoid sampling those zeros and picking something you're already currently satisfying. However, there's just generally not much sparsity inside of a residual, right? Most systems don't have these kind of pathological codependences, and so you'd only be satisfying one of the equations at a time, and so there's just not much sparsity to, to use. So what we're going to use instead is something that looks a little bit like sparsity, but instead measures roughly the ratio between what a randomized Kashmir step would be and what a Motzkin's method step would be, or a greedy step would be. So we're going to use the dynamic range, which is defined as the ratio between the expected squared 2 norm of the sampled subresidual and the expected squared infinity norm of the sampled subresidual. Okay. And as soon as we have this, we can actually pr pretty quickly show our holy grail. So um, if we have our, a consistent system, unique solution, uh, I'm showing you here in this case the case when the rows are normalized, although we can generalize that, that assumption away. Um, we're able to prove, again, you know, at least linearly, at least linear convergence and expectation, but now this ratio, worst case ratio between consecutive error terms, has a presence of beta in the numerator of this um, fraction. 
And what was previously there is still there, sigma, uh, the minimum singular value of a squared over m. And we've also introduced this dynamic range gamma j. Okay. So let me first say before we start discussing that, that result further, that this seems to govern the behavior of um, these methods fairly well. So what we're showing here is the um, same picture as before, but now with actually the theoretical bounds added on. Okay, so the dark, the filled in lines are um, the empirical behavior, the convergence of these methods, and the um, dotted lines are the bounds provided by the theoretical result I just presented before. Um, let me highlight what was previously known before our result was that all of these, behavior, these convergence behaviors were bounded in the worst case by this black dotted line. Okay, and so now we have a theoretical result that seems to much better track with the empirical behavior of the method. Okay. But probably many of you are like, but you have to you know, compute this gamma j if you want to use the bound. And that's, of course, even more expensive than actually solving the original system of equations. So this is really only useful if we can say something about gamma j. So there's a few things we can say immediately. So first of all, gamma j is somewhere between beta and one, right? And it, when it's one, that's the best case. Smaller is better for us. And so what we previously had was these expected convergence, worst case convergence results, where the alpha that people could show were given in this table. Okay, so for both RK and SKM, we have exactly the same um, value that we've seen many times before. Fudging things a little bit, actually, we had some previous work that improved this for Motzkin's method. But now we've able, been able to improve both SKM and Motzkin's method simultaneously. So now we know for every system, the alpha, the worst case bound on alpha, is going to land it somewhere between what was previously known and something that could be much, much better, potentially. Okay? But still, right, in order to figure out where your alpha lands, you would have to compute this thing, which is equivalent to solving your problem to begin with. Okay, it's not great. But if you have speci specific systems with um, some structure that you can take advantage of, you can prove things about the gamma j to begin with, and then use that a priori in these results. Okay. So we were able to do that for a few systems. So we did this for uh, Gaussian systems, right? When the uh, matrix defining your system has IID random, uh, Gaussian random, uh, um, random variable entries, and then also for the type of system I described before, average consensus systems, which is a classical problem in distributed computing. Okay. So at least for those types of systems, we have now an increased convergence rate, and I invite you to prove your favorite bounds on your favorite systems and apply these results. Okay, and, and let me just say, I showed this for uh, systems where the rows of the norms were all equal, but we can actually generalize this fairly easily. So uh, we can immediately generalize to um, dynamic SKM, so where you, the sample size is changing in every iteration. And then if we want to generalize to a non-normalized A matrix, we, we have to change the sampling distribution slightly. But once we do so, we prove a result that generalizes both the seminal result of Stromer and Vershinen and a simple result for Motzkin's method, which didn't previously exist. The results were quite complicated if the rows were not normalized. Okay, and like I said, now if you have your favorite system, hand it to me. I'll try to understand what its dynamic range looks like and tell you how fast SKM will converge. Okay, uh, let me skip this a little bit. So the result, the proof is of the normalized system is fairly simple. It uses the Pythagorean theorem and then just some simple steps of analysis on the expected improvement or the step that's made within the, um, within the method. Okay, and um, like I said, I'm not interested in just showing these increased convergence rates. I wanted to be able to be handed a system and then say, yes, this is the optimal sample size that you should choose. And we can kind of do it. So if we know some bounds on gamma j, we can estimate the optimal uh, sample size. So what I'm showing you here is a, a plot which shows um, number of flops needed to achieve a specific strop stopping criterion. So that's our proxy for computational time versus the sample size beta. The blue dotted line is the empirically required, actually experimentally required. And then the red is a bound which was built using our 
um, result that I've, I've been presenting. Okay, and so empirically, we see that the optimal beta for this very small system was two, and what we would have estimated was four. So off by two. Okay, so zoomed in, let's zoom back out, and I'll offer some um, application results and then conclude. So um, we solved the least squares problem because we wanted to use that in our forward propagation step of neural NMF, which solves the hierarchical NMF model. I'm gonna show you some applications where we compare three different methods. The first method is the one that I described. It's a naive approach where you apply, insert your favorite method for non-negative matrix factorization in a hierarchy. Okay, so you simply apply, fix the matrix, apply, fix the matrix, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm also going to apply a method known as deep NMF, which is a result of Flenner and Hunter. Um, so this is a, a method that attempts to use the uh, factorizations at later layers to influence previous layers. Unfortunately, it really only ties two consecutive layers together. It's not able to completely fully backpropagate. And then finally, I'm going to compare, obviously, our method, neural NMF, which does a full backpropagation along all of the layers simultaneously. Okay, so I'll begin with the synthetic data set that we constructed for exactly this purpose. <coughs> and so um, what I'm showing you is an image of uh, the data set, and um, the rows here are the objects, and we're collecting them into nine topics, which are visualized as the darkest blue blocks. Okay, and then those are collected into four super topics, which are the middle blue four blocks, and then finally those are con collected into super super topics, um, given by the two lightest blocks. I didn't want to write super super topics because it looks so strange. Um, okay, so uh, the results I'm going to show you. So initially I'm going to show you something that really doesn't tell you if we're achieving the goal of determining the hierarchy of the topics in this data set but it kind of gives you an idea of how things are going for these methods. So on the left is the original data set, and then these three pictures on the right illustrate the actual product of the factor matrices resolved by each of the methods. Okay, so this is the reconstruction of, of the original data set, which this is not um, what this task is for. But um, what we can see is that neural NMF just visually is resolving more of the features of the data set than the others. Okay, but now let's look into neural NMF and see if it's actually doing correctly the task we, we ask it to do. Okay, so we have the original data set, and the, I'm presenting both the A0 and A1 matri matrix matrices, which collect um, at every uh, layer of hier hierarchy the um, topics into super topics. So this A0 matrix collects the rows into the nine topics. And if you squint, those nine darkest blocks in that matrix are the right, the same size as the nine blocks in the original matrix. Okay, so it's collecting at least rows into topics well. The A1 matrix is going to collect topics into super topics. Okay, so these uh, two um, blocks here correspond to these two columns here. So it's collecting those two um, columns that should be collected. And then again, we have another two columns collected, two columns collected, and then three columns collected. Okay, so at least for two layers of this hierarchy, it is roughly constructing the correct hierarchy. Okay, so let me now move to the MyLime data. And the initial um, results I'm gonna present, I, you don't need to look at any of the words on the slide. I just wanna show you some of the kind of ideal properties we've identified out of neural NMF. So if you, you know, naively apply sequential, uh, sequential NMF, um, often the factor matrices that are produced tend to be less sparse than the factor matrices identified by neural NMF. And the application of, of um, neural NMF is to develop these um, uh, resolutions of the hierarchy of symptoms into topics. And so it's ideal to have sparsity because it more clearly tells whoever is looking at this which symptoms belong to which topics. Okay? And this happens at multiple um, scales. So here's a, a higher scale, uh, sorry, a lower scale um, uh, hierarchy. <coughs> okay. So now let me briefly get into an actual um, hierarchical vis visualization. So what I'm visualizing here is the collection of first symptoms into six topics 
And then those same symptoms visualized, collected, once you go through two layers of the hierarchy into five super topics, and then through three layers of the hierarchy into four super, super topics, okay? So it's really hard to see, but I have boxed these with colors to try to help you track them through the um, hierarchy. So here, this initial blue topic also exists right here, and then it combines with part of this teal topic to form uh, this blue topic. Okay, so I'm not gonna make you look at this too much. I'm just gonna highlight one thing. So if you look at this topic here, the teal topic, it consists of symptoms, bullseye rash, evidence of tick bite, and early other symptoms. Now if you move across into the later hierarchical levels, you'll see that it actually gets broken up and split between two of the super topics. So bullseye rash ended up up here, and it's actually being split between this blue and this red topic. And roughly this kind of um, topic that's um, so vivid initially as an early symptoms of, of Lyme disease topic is being dissolved as it goes through the data set. So what that suggests is that this um, topic, while initially resolved in high detail, um, is not resolved in the later um, hierarchy, in indicating that it's not actually a topic experienced by our uh, patients too vividly. Okay? Not many of them are experiencing that, as opposed to things like um, nerve pain or red skin rash. Okay? <coughs> now the reason I'm highlighting that is because um, there's been a movement over roughly the past 10 years away from using the bullseye rash, which is kind of thought of as this high indicator for Lyme disease, as a diagnosing symptom. So it used to be if you walked in and you thought you might have Lyme disease but you didn't have that bullseye rash, it might take quite a while for doctors to finally agree, yes, we should try to give you this Lyme disease test. But physicians over the past 10 years, um, due to recommendations by the CDC, have been moving away from that. And we're, we're seeing that in our data set. Our um, patients don't have um, strong indication of that uh, symptom. Okay, now let me just finally show you one more result. So we have within our data set a single question that asks the patients, are you currently well or unwell? And based entirely upon their response to that question, we can split the data set into two pieces. Okay? When we do so, and we apply the same um, hierarchical factorization, and we look at one of the resolutions, what we find is that the unwell patients experience this bullseye rash, evidence of tick bite, um, and other symptoms um, in a group with a bunch of other symptoms. Okay, so you might think like they walk in, they're presenting, they're like, yeah, I have a bullseye rash, but I'm also complaining of joint pain, you know, a headache, lots of other things that might come up in a doctor's office. Whereas the well patients are exper experiencing it in a specific symptom. So that could indicate that some of those patients walked into the, di to the doctor's office and that was all they showed. They said like, hey, I got bit by a, a tick and there's a bullseye rash, right? <coughs> So this bullseye rash topic doesn't end up persisting through um, the hierarchy of, of topics. And the unwell and well patients have very different presentation of bullseye rash symptom. And so this has kind of led us to, um, well, not us, the, the physicians we work with, to begin to ask if we could move beyond the data set we're currently using and ask a more um, kind of interesting question, which is whether patients that these patients are unwell because they're lacking that bullseye rash for the diagnosis, or if it's actually indicative of some other disease pathway. So the, the version of Lyme disease that some of the patients had was different and more confusing um, and hard for the doctors to, to diagnose. Okay, so let me just pr um, present some final conclusions. So I showed um, this hierarchical non-negative matrix factorization model implemented as a neural, a feed-forward neural network presented a, a forward and back propagation method known as neural NMF, zoomed in on one of the subproblems, and um, presented a family of methods for solving that subproblem known as sampling cache marks Motskin methods. And then I've showed you some actual applications of the neural NMF methods to some real and some synthetic data. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>